everyone. I'm looking at the number of participants and we're reasonably stable. So in the interest of time, should we, should we get started? Good. I'll take that as a yes in that case. So, um, hi, welcome to the AI for Justice session. My name is Dave De Silva. I'm from Capgemini UK and, uh, and the, uh, the CTO for Data Science and AI. So I'll be um, facilitating the session uh, today and introducing our four or three talkers. So we're over running a little bit. So I think the plan now is to run until 4.45. So that's an extra 15 minutes on the original agenda. Um, that said though, I know that all of the presenters and myself will be um, available after that. So we don't need to necessarily wrap up discussions at 4.45, um, but we'll certainly aim to complete all of the presentations by that point. Um, one more point, and I think this is something we've seen throughout, um, put any of your questions in the chat and we will take those questions at the end of all of the presentations. So um, rather than addressing questions at the end of each presentation, we'll take them all at the end. And that makes um, makes our times a bit more straightforward. So um, would you mind moving on to the next slide? I think we're going to start off with a poll. So I'll ask Melina to introduce this. So please insert the code or scan the QR code you see on the slide so you can participate in the poll. I will now share the live screen of the poll so we can see what people will answer. I will leave it on for a bit so you can scan the QR code or type in the number code. Do you see AI as an opportunity or as a threat to justice? So I think this is a pretty clear result. Most of them are positive about AI, but some see it as a threat. We will go on with the presentation now that we have this quick impression. Ah, no, next poll, sorry. <laughs> the presentation before was um, with only one poll. So now that we know that most of you see AI as an opportunity to justice, we ask you to type in some use cases which you can think of in that area, just anything you can think of where you can adapt AI to justice, scan in the code or type in the number code so that you can participate in the poll. This is more of a technical question. Okay, looks like that doesn't happen anything anymore. So that's basically the picture we got. And now we can continue with the presentation. I'll pass it on to Dave. <laughs> okay, thanks very much for partaking in the poll then. So if you could um, jump onto the next slide, Marina. So today's session is very much focused on the sustainable development goals. So um, we're focusing on number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. So I'll give everyone uh, a few seconds to read the SDG that we're focusing upon today. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind now moving on to the next um, view, Melina, just to show the next animation. So it's interesting that actually, uh, you know, that's quite a lofty goal that we're aiming for globally here. And um, a lot of um, governments, a lot of institutions within those governments are really seeing how AI can support, start to support their their development towards the achievement of that goal and especially around law enforcement for example so just picking out a few key points here on the left hand side you see six countries listed out who've already um, called out law enforcement and crime prevention as part of their national ai strategy um, and all of these are hyperlinked that you can access after the um, presentation um, I mean, two, two things struck me here. Firstly, the fact that these countries have national AI strategies, that's a huge step forward. Imagine suggesting that would have happened five, 10 years ago. And second, the fact that at the heart of those strategies is the thoughts around law enforcement and crime prevention. So really impressive progress we're seeing already in this area. And I think this is kind of reinforcing the results of the poll area earlier, the fact that um, society as a whole are starting to consider AI not as a as a novelty or as a sort of academic tool, but as a, a real tool that can support you know, the, the core of government and the judicial system. Um, three countries have gone a step further and stood up actual AI centers um, that cater for law enforcement. So uh, I should be clear here, um, Germany, Australia and Japan are the ones that have come public. I'm pretty confident there are others around the world that are not yet ready to talk about their public activities, but again, it's very positive to see steps in the right directions by national governments around the world. So if you'd move on to the next slide, please. Now, I wanna focus a little bit now on the um, Unicre report that was produced jointly with Interpol at a global meeting last year. Um, to be clear though, um, they're about to do the next meeting 
on in November this year. So some of these results may change slightly, but having looked at the report, I'm pretty confident that the underlying principles um, won't be shifting substantially. So let's go through them quickly now. Um, let's talk about the how and how they propose utilizing AI for law enforcement. So we touched on some of these general principles earlier in the introductory presentations, but these are really general principles that apply to AI, but really apply to law enforcement more generally. You know, these are a pretty high level, but actually the report has gone a step further and said, well, when we start to look through the lens of AI, how can we make those things more practical, more transparent, more accountable, fairer and explainable, of course. So all the while reinforcing the themes here that AI is a tool to be used in the right situations um, in a sensible manner, in a responsible manner. Um, linked to these principles and these requirements. And then if you um, increment again, Melina, we've then got the, what does AI actually consist of in this context? So um, you've got a general theme of audio processing, visual and natural language processing, very much augmenting the human operators here. So taking things that people do naturally, um, but are pretty time consuming to process, you know, hours and hours of um, audio footage or images, or large amounts of free text and trying to augment that process using AI systems. You've then got a resource augmentation, optimization, sorry, which is taking it a step further to say, actually, um, an AI is very good at managing, you know, many moving parts with huge amounts of information, especially um, highly transactional, so high speed information in high volume. Um, people just aren't good at that. So that's really where an AI can come into its own and supporting that optimization of, of quite limited law enforcement resources. Um, the report goes a step further though, and again, if you don't mind incrementing the animation, um, and this is the area I think is really impressive. They provided a toolkit to say, well, actually, um, how can you how can you use a AI to try and support these related requirements and general principles in law enforcement? And there's some really useful stuff from there around general explanations, some of the, the buzzwords and what they actually mean, but then going down into the guidance and best practices and defining who your target audience is, who those decision makers are, who those law enforcers are, you need to be um, consuming this information and consuming these solutions. So again, I strongly recommend going into that report and I've grabbed one, one quote from it before I hand over to our first talker. So um, really the point here is, the question is not should we use AI, but it's how should we use AI and how should we do it in a, you know, a responsible and appropriate manner? Um, and I think that's a general theme of the discussion today. I think most people are, are fairly convinced that AI can be a force for good around law enforcement, um, but it really needs to be done in a balanced manner and a sensible manner. So I'd always urge you to think about two things as we're going through the, um, the next three presentations. Um, Melina, if you could press the final animation, and that is, you know, looking at the use cases here, what are the use cases? What do you see as the opportunities in law enforcement? And the second question is, how can you implement them and how can you implement them responsibly? Um, so I bear in mind those two things as we're going through these three presentations. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Gregor Stroyan, who is the chair of CAHAI, um, the ad hoc committee on AI for the Council of Europe. So over to you. Hi. Do you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi, it's a great honor to participate at uh, this event. Uh, congratulations, first of all, to the organizers for preparing such a diverse and uh, at the same time in-depth webinar. And also thank you participants uh, for choosing this particular breakout session among so many interesting ones that are happening at the same time. Um, obviously, artificial intelligence provides a number of opportunities for judicial and other state institutions to improve their efficiency, both from a quantitative as well as qualitative perspective. Just let me set the timer so that I don't go too much into uh, other speakers' time. So, some applications are relatively low risk, and even generic tools can be adapted to judicial procedures, for example, speech to text, automated transcription or pseudonymization. Others can help courts and institutions to manage their affairs, for example, for allocation of resources. Identification and analysis of similar cases or issues, assessment of success, preparation of summaries and drafts, or even chat boxes assisting with access to courts issues 
or even online dispute resolution, they're all becoming a reality. With the rising complexity and effectiveness of applications, we do start seeing that some can create high risks, especially for human rights. A problematic approach to some applications in the past, such as well-known examples of reoffending risk assessment, which affected the chance of parole, have at the same time caused much damage to a potentially wider implementation of AI solutions. It's probably something that was mentioned in previous sec uh, sections and breakout sections, that there is some sort of a fear from users to use applications or even to go into investments or developments. It is clear in principle that AI or any other solutions should not create new inequalities or even more so create risks for the concept of justice, the fairness. While we should strive for increased efficiency, we should also keep in mind the essential aspect of justice in the eyes of the citizens. They rely on trust and confidence in the functioning of the system. We have some sort of a human ability to accept mistakes of an individual, but when it comes to a machine, the effect of a single mistake can be exponential and can affect not only the results, but also perception and adoption of the technology in new environments. So how do we go about combining both efficiency and trust and develop trustworthy systems? In about two years ago, in December 2018, Council of Europe's European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice, so-called CEPESH, adopted the European Ethical Charter on the use of artificial intelligence in judicial systems and their environment. That was the first European instrument to set out five substantial and methodological principles that apply to the automated processing of judicial decisions and data based on AI techniques. And you have them on your screen. I will not go too much into details. Uh, what I can say, and I will be quoting um, the UNESCO draft recommendations, it's the ethical values and principles can powerfully shape the development and implementation of rights-based policy measures and legal norms by providing guidance where the ambit of norms is unclear or where such norms are not yet in place due to the fast pace of technological development combined with the relatively slower pace of policy responses. This claim is absolutely correct. However, the problem with the principles and recommendations is that they remain, remain unbinding, they're not binding, and they're not enforceable. Also, within the last couple of years, uh, can we go into the next slide, please? In the next, uh, last couple of years, we have seen a proliferation of various ethical charters and other initiatives. It seemed to be causing more confusion than creating practical solutions. What are the principles and how that we should take into consideration and how should we go about them? And policy responses really do not need to be too slow. However, in order to make them practical, we also need to make principles operational. CEPESH, for its part, is working together with IEEE on creating oper operationalization of standards on the basis of these principles for certain types of application. For example, legal search and predictive justice. And I believe that this is the way to go. Individual sectors will establish their own standards, but due to both limited resources on one hand and horizontal issues connecting most types of applications on the other, common solutions for quality and impact control of certain aspects will need to be developed. Nature of AI further instructs us to seek international, if not even global solutions. Cross-border nature, dual nature, dual use nature, the hidden applications, the inability of small players, both on the development and on the procurement side, to verify or even negotiate terms and conditions, motivation for disruption that is present in some, all create a danger of race to bottom through gradually accepting lowering of standards. I was listening often to claims that we will be the first in developing this type of a, type of a system or first artificial intelligence court and so on. We should not strive for that. We should strive for effective solutions that at the same time maintain the standards that we have developed in protecting human rights and rule of law. So when it comes to applications to have an impact on human rights, oversight mechanisms need to be developed. If not for anything else, then because of the state's objective responsibilities to prevent human rights violations. 
And this, of course, connects not only to responsibilities, but also potential liability. There is another risk when it comes to human rights if left solely to national fragmentation. There is a risk for development of autocratic tendencies and for gradual loosening or even breaking of the common bonds in international communities. Prevention of such developments is one of the reasons international and supranational organizations have been established in the past in the first place. Cooperation, elaboration of clear standards based on common values and principles, monitoring, prevention, and enforcement are crucial to prevent such digressions. A consensus is emerging, including within the private sector, on the need to go beyond ethics and to define a comprehensive legal framework on AI. Uncertainty in the market has a negative effect on demand, lowers willingness to invest, and prevents scalability. Developers desire predictability of the market and also want to avoid potential risks, potential liability. Council of Europe already has a long and proven history of dealing with new technologies and their impact on human rights, rule of law, and democracy, and its conventions have been ratified by many non-member countries as well. In the past, it has created clear, binding, and effective rules also in the fields of pharmaceuticals and biotech. For example, Oviedo Convention created a red line by prohibited human cloning, and it's effective. Convention on European Pharmacopeia created a system of quality verification of medical products and procedures. Before that, people were sell selling snake oil. Similarly, many binding forms already exist that can be applied to artificial intelligence, notably in the European Convention on Human Rights and the case law of the European Court on Human Rights, as well as in specialized instruments. Uh, next slide, please. As well as specialized instruments such as Convention 108 and one more such as Convention 108 plus, which is often referred to as the grandmother of GDPR. Due to the sui generis nature of artificial intelligence and the novel ways in which it might be applied, however, it seems the relevant standards would best be defined in a new instrument. This is why the Committee of Ministers established the Intergovernmental Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence, so-called CAHAI, last year in September. On the first plenary session last November, I was elected as its chair, and we've been instructed to examine the feasibility and potential elements of a legal framework for the development, design, and application of artificial intelligence applications in order to ensure that they are in line with human rights, rule of law, and democracy. Next slide, please. As you can see from this photo, we have a very broad membership of member states, participants, and observers. It needs to be noted that Council of Europe has 47 member states, uh, consisting of more than 830 million inhabitants. And we also have uh, countries like um, United States, Canada, Mexico, Israel, um, Japan, as observer countries, and especially Me Mexico, uh, Japan, and Israel have been recently very much involved with CAHAI. We have a number of participants and uh, other inst international institutions, NGOs, private sector working with us. In addition to mapping of risks and opportunities, next slide, please. This is the draft of the feasibility study that we are creating. And in addition to mapping of risks and opportunities, where we also cooperated with uh, Kathleen Miller, hello, if you're perhaps here, as an expert, we are taking taking into account the numerous initiatives of AI regulation, which are considered or undertaken globally, in particular by the European Union, OECD, UNESCO, and the United Nations. Also in order to identify already elaborated common values and principles, existing solutions, overlaps, and gaps. We are all faced with common challenges, and we need to provide a coherent response. Each organization has its own mandate, but at the end of the day, our work should be complementary if it is to be effective. A comprehensive and well-balanced legal framework should regulate the design, development, and application of specific AI with a view of minimizing and managing risks while stimulating development and use and allowing to reap the benefits and promises. We are currently examining a full spectrum of options for regulation, and this goes from the lightest soft law instruments to a binding international convention for AI. You can see it under um, item eight, what are the options? The objective is not to regulate technology as such, but to make sure that from the early stages of the design, human rights affirming principles are embedded in the process and applications. 
such as those principles that we've already heard in previous sessions, like transparency, explainability, user control, privacy, and so on. The high is looking at the steps which need to be taken to ensure accountability of all those involved in the development chain and subsequent life cycle. Mechanisms of ex ante verification and certification, oversight by independent authorities, are of key importance in this respect. And they will be also a key condition to ensure effectiveness and concrete implementation of the legal framework. We will discuss and hopefully adopt the draft feasibility study at our third plenary meeting this December. This should allow us to move forward with elaboration of specific legal instruments and to prepare concrete proposals for the Committee of Ministers by the end of 2021 or on when our mandate runs out. So this was a bit broader than just justice, but justice is a big part of what we're doing uh, and why we're doing this at Kahai. And I hope uh, it answered some of the questions how we are going to deal with it and what is important. And I will be available for any questions later on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gregor. Uh, so uh, as you said, um, please put any questions in the chat and we'll pick those up after we've heard from our two other presenters. So at this point, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Angirand Preval, who's gonna talk from Capgemini Front. Yes, hello everyone. So yes, I'm Angirand Preval. I'm a data scientist in Capgemini. And uh, I want to share you um, some insight I get from a uh, justice uh, domain in AI. And first of all, I would like to see uh, with you why, why, why justice need AI. And so yeah, it, the beginning is pretty obvious. It's like in, in any other domains, uh, we are at a point where we have plenty of data. Uh, we have models, we have platforms uh, well implemented there. And uh, we have also officials and people who are who get some skills uh, the, the, these previous years and are now ready to uh, implement some some AI and, and in their process. Uh, the, the second thing is that nowadays people are expecting justice to reflect the equality they want to see in the society, and then. Uh, yeah, they are less forgiving about uh, errors that could be committed in justice system. So we have to be aware of that and and uh, be able to, with AI, to uh, uh, improve a bit the equality we can put in justice. And the last point is uh, touching every domain, of course, it's economic pressure. And uh, AI is not, of course, therefore um, replacing human, but uh, with with AI, you can um, you can save cost, you can uh, improve performance, and this has to be taken into account. So yeah, I, I, let's highlight uh, let's highlight some some use cases we can have uh, in, uh, in in justice. First of all, let's talk about citizens. Um, one thing very helpful that could um, use every citizens could be the a search engine, basically like a, a Google for justice. And uh, and this could be very nice because yeah we are not in a, in a world anymore where you you put your, you you take your a big a low book and uh, find some information on, uh, in, inside it. No, now we want uh, everything uh, right uh, at the time. So and that's normal. That's how the world evolved. So so we we need tools uh, to do what we want and. Um, the second one is like um, a, a lawyer board for citizens. So again, the idea is not to replace uh, lawyers, but uh, the fact is, as a citizen, we have no really knowledge about uh, uh, law or very minimal knowledge. And even even for um, even if we don't know if uh, we have a case or if we want to go to the court for something, um, we still have to call a lawyer. At the very beginning, just to get this information, and, uh, and 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 this should be different because yes, we should have tools just to inform a bit uh, ourselves, uh, depending on our specific context and our situation and what happened to us. Uh, the two next one was is, is more focused on the uh, justice court, and so uh, one uh, funny funny uh, uh, tool could be uh, our models could be. Uh, to automate checking of uh, cases motivation. So the idea is that 
uh, there is so many cases every day on, in, in the court. And uh, we could, with a, a bit of uh, time and effort, we could uh, build a tool uh, to check all the motivations of a, a specific case, for instance, and uh, verify the links and, uh, and, where, and where come from the information. And uh, it, it should be, uh, and, and with, with that, uh, judges could now directly, if a, if, a, if a case is well built or not, or maybe there is some, something uh, not really uh, uh, consistent in, inside. So uh, another one is, is to super justice decision. So again, this is not, uh, I'm not talking about all the justice domain in general, but some specific part of justice and laws and laws application uh, really wants these kind of uh, of, uh, of tools and uh, and solutions and it already exists already, uh, actually and so it's there just to to with the help of the of the judge uh, get the fair the, the more fearful um, uh, judgment decision um, Analyzing biases in laws application is also something very powerful you can do. You you, you can do with AI, and uh, maybe we can we will talk uh, about that a bit later. And the uh, last thing I wanted to highlight it is uh, fraud detection. Fraud detection we are used to see this uh, this use case in uh, in so many domains, but uh, in justice too it could be uh, very useful because uh, yes, for instance, uh, when you think about uh, guardianship. And uh, especially for elder people, uh, there is many cases where, uh, where there is some fraud and, uh, and actually uh, modeling a fraud detection algorithms is quite simple and, uh, and I'm sure you, you will, will be able to find uh, uh, easily some patterns to detect fraud detection on, on this field. Uh, yeah, last thing, because I, I don't want to be too, too long, but um, maybe we can go to the next slide, because I, I wanted to show you a, a use case we did for Ministry of Justice, and we are quite proud of it. So it was, it, it talks about uh, damage compensation. So the idea is when you get a damage, uh, you are expecting from the, from, from the justice uh, to get um, an amount depending of what you what, what you add uh, as an injury. Uh, for instance, you get hit by a car, uh, you will not be able to go to the to the office for two months. Uh, you can say goodbye to your uh, uh, to your year and your season in uh, in your football team. Anything like this should be retributed retributed by an amount uh, depending of yeah your specific situation. And the, fact, the, the, the thing is that we have many, many, many previous cases uh, in our databases, and uh, which help us to categorize um, situation and context and, uh, and the amount uh, you deserve uh, depending on this uh, context. So the build is quite, the, the aim is quite, uh, quite clear. Uh, we wanted to estimate depending on the situation and on a resume of a situation, uh, a fork of the estimation, uh, a, a fork of the estimation of the amount you deserve. Uh, this is for citizen at first because, uh, as I said before, it's nice uh, when you don't really know how to deal with law. Uh, at first, to yeah, make quick search on internet, maybe have a specific lawyer tool. Uh, to uh, see, to, to, to uh, retrieve uh, the closest cases, previous cases uh, that happen in your country. And, uh, and, um, and yes, now that if it's, if it's worth your not to, to, to go to the court for, for your case uh, before calling a lawyer. For the magistrates, uh, it, it could be very nice too, because uh, as I was saying also, it's very important for them to analyze biases in uh, application of the law. For instance, uh, is uh, the amount you, you, you deserve for uh, um, a, de a, a damage in, uh, in your office, uh, in your career, uh, is more valuable when you are a man uh, than a, a, few, uh, um, a woman, that, that should be seen somewhere. Uh, 
uh, or if a county uh, have different applications uh, from another county, uh, yes, you, 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 you judges and magistrates uh, need uh, these this, uh, powerful tools to, um, to be more equal uh, on, a, on a general country. And for public policy also, it's, it's like a dream when you, I mean, the ultimate goal of a public policy is that when you make, a, when you make an amendment, uh, you want to see how it works and uh, how, how the application of the law evolves. And this, with, with this kind of tool, uh, you have this uh, on a plate. So, uh, so yeah, that was mainly the idea. And, uh, and so we, we were able to build a, 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 nice, um, a nice solution for this, which cover uh, citizen magistrate and public policy. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty all. So thanks you, thank you a lot for uh, listening to me and I will uh, let Richard present you uh, a stack with uh, Dave. Okay, thank you very much. So Richard, over to you for the final presentation. Richard, I think you're muted at the moment. I don't know if we need to set you up as a presenter. Hello. Yeah, that's better. Go for it. Yeah, you can hear me, right? Wonderful. Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, so building on um, some of the use cases then that Angaron was uh, uh, was speaking about just now. So what we've done at Capgemini is we've really developed a, a platform, uh, really, and a, and a set of uh, techniques and concepts that we've aptly named Haystank. The haystack to uh, to essentially help ministries and government departments with um, their investigation and intelligence into uh, fraudulent and criminal uh, behaviour. Um, and what 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 we have essentially done is we have uh, amalgamated um, uh, leading industry experience, um, technical leadership, and some cutting edge thinking into uh, essentially a tool set that allows us to express this uh, concept to our clients, to uh, governments, and indeed to the justice sector. Uh, if you could stick to the next slide, please, uh, Melina. Um, and what we, uh, and in the market there, that there are um, actually a number, uh, uh, several use cases where this, our haystack uh, concept could, could, could actually apply, but we have focused our platform on um for the time being at least on public services and also financial services in detecting criminal behavior and fraudulent activity at, uh, at any given point um next slide please uh, melina um and there are already a, a number of big vendors in the market that offer off-the-shelf investigation and intelligence tools some some truly quite quite large vendors that do this um, however, those those sort of tool sets often require multiple interfaces to to surface different data sets, and they are often non-customizable in terms of the technology suite. Uh, and also, it's it's and therefore it's an oft, often a one-size-fits-all type solution, uh, and often doesn't really embed um, or, or or make use of any uh, AI to augment the the human-centered investigation that. Um, uh, that, that has to be done using these tool sets. Um, next slide, uh, please, Melina. Uh, and therefore, Capgemini have um, identified a bit of a gap in the in the market here, where we are um, where, where we are re really promoting the, the concept, really, of being able to seamlessly investigate federated data sets, pairing those data sets together with a, a, a nice customizable tech stack, a slick UI, and also some AI embedded to augment that human-centered interaction. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Melina. Rattling through these nice and uh, nice and quickly. Um, so our solution overcomes some organizational boundaries. So it, it has the ability to, to request some external data sets, which is, uh, which is a really useful feature. Um, and next slide, please, Melina, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and it also, uh, and predominantly, 
and, and this is rather this is the rather key uh, component and technique to uh, to this platform as a whole uh, and this way of thinking is enabling the seamless analysis of local um, and remote data sets. Um, data being made available either through a virtualization layer or being pulled using any kind of data orchestration technique. Um, we have a little video um, that will bring this to life and explain it, I'm sure, in a far, uh, far better way. Um, and, uh, and enjoy the context. Yeah. Um, when I play the video and you hear the audio, please make a quick sign so I know the audio is working for everybody who switched on their camera. Thank you. No. Okay, so apparently the audio is not uh, provided. Um, it was actually planned that the audio would be transferred. Uh, would you mind commenting on it a bit, Richard? Because we can see the animations anyway. Uh, you can see the animations, can you? Okay, cool. So, yeah, the um, animation. You can so, see, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So what you so what you will have uh, will will be seeing here is uh, is the ability to use some kind of uh, essentially an enterprise search facility um, whereby an investigator is is conducting a, is conducting an investigation into an individual that they suspect might be conducting some form of uh, criminal activity um, so uh, you would have seen that the video uh, searched for a relatively common uh, English name uh, I think it's a John Smith that is used um, and, and there are obviously a lot of uh, John Smiths across uh, across the world, and, and certainly within uh, within the UK. Um, so the first uh, uh, clever nature of this kind of tool set is working out well which John Smith could it be based on a number of different factors. So that's the first uh, point. Um, and then the, uh, the 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 solution goes on to, uh, and then the investigator goes on to uh, introduce different data sets to try and highlights what this uh, this particular individual has been um, has been doing um, using sources of information such as AMPR they think they're crossing uh, traveling from one place to another uh, and they can pick up a, a car registration number as an example so all of these are, are mechanisms really by which uh, or different data sets even that are being accessed through this UI um, with the ability to request access to external data sets that perhaps this particular organization doesn't necessarily harness all of the time. Um, an example could be, you know, if it's uh, this, this investigation is being run by a police force, they might need access to some um, border information. Um, they might need access to, well, the ANPR information. They could act, need to access some, some other kind of data. So um, what this actually, what this tool set and this technique allows is the ability to request that data set um, and either access it through a virtualization layer, uh, some kind of data orchestration, or indeed um, that data is passed in a, in, a, in, a, in, in a defined format by the organization it's been requested from. So as the video plays, and we, I think we would probably be able to share this link afterwards because it has got quite a nice, a nice voiceover. And what you can see here broadly is in, within that user interface, that investigator going in and analyzing uh, different data points to enable me to spot um, and criminal activity and essentially gather uh, gather some evidence. So to conclude, um, then if you could just flick off this Melina onto the, onto the last slide. Um, to conclude then, the Haystack platform um, that we have developed within, within Capgemini is, is an amalgamation of thinking that addresses some of the most challenging aspects uh, that are prevalent today um, with investigating criminal behavior, gathering that key evidence and bringing um, these particular individuals to justice. Um, with this platform um, built on, with a platform that is built on the concepts and the thinking behind Haystack in terms of the federated access and requesting that access to data, um, it means that we can embed several uh, uh, realms of AI that could then proactively highlight where this suspicious activity is taking place, helping to augment that uh, human investigator to be uh, more efficient 
uh, and more effective in their mechanisms by which they actually uh, are able to investigate and gather this evidence that they can then provide um, to uh, to the courts or, or the police force or whoever is conducting this uh, uh, this type of investigation. So two separate or a load of different concepts really is how to harness this data, how to, how to access it, how to pair it together and how AI could be employed for good um, in, uh, uh, in, in delivering a, a more efficient and effective uh, route to justice. Uh, thanks, and I'll hand over back to, uh, to Dave, I believe, just to conclude in a Q&A. Thanks, Rich, and thanks to all our presenters. So um, I've just had a, an update from our, our facilitation team. So we're all due back in the, um, the plenary at um, 5 p.m., so that's in about 13 minutes. So uh, before, before wrapping up and concluding this session, and of course uh, answering any questions people have, there's one final poll. So um, Melina, do you want to take our audience through this poll? Yes. So again, just scan the QR code or type in the, the code you can see on the slide and then rate the five AI use cases in terms of their impact in attaining the SDGs and the feasibility. How positive or how intense would their impact on attaining the SDGs be and how easy are they to implement? How high is their feasibility? That's basically the question. Just log in and we're going to see what the results are to get a general picture. I'm going to leave it on for a bit so you can scan the QR code and type in the number code on menti.com. And just for your information, all the materials are going to be provi provided after the event. So sorry for the video problems. We um, were thinking that the audio trans transmission would work, but it didn't. So you can watch the video and afterwards as well. Um, but Richard delivered a pretty good comment on the, on the video, although he didn't at all, uh, although he's not a professional on this. So we're going to share the screen with the poll to see the live results with the correct thing, obviously. Here, present. Well, we already see a bit of results. If I, if I click on the points, if I slide over them, you can see the individual voting points. Those are basically the, just the averages and the little points are the individual votes. So as you can see, analyzing suspicious financial transactions can be very hard to implement, but has a high impact on the SDGs when you look at the opinions from our audience. We wait for more people to participate, so maybe we can get a clearer picture. Because right now it's just number five, which is kind of in a special position. But maybe while we watch the animation, how people are gonna vote, maybe while we do that, um, Dave can approach some questions. You can ask some questions in the chat or just unmute yourself and do that, I guess, until five. We have 10 minutes left, so I guess that's enough. Okay, so we've got a question to Gregor. Um, Gregor, do you want me to read that out to the audience or is everyone able to see it in the chat? Maybe read it out real quick because... Sure, okay. So uh, when talking about accountability slash liability, the notion of causal relationship is crucial. If the process towards a result or output made by AI is not clear, consequently the causal relationship is not clear either. So accountability becomes basically impossible. Um, so how do you solve that? Yes, it's true. The systems are complex, and especially as they stack up, and uh, when some code is used from a previous system or um, data is uh, coming in um, dynamically, it's impossible to uh, have complete uh, accountability at all times. But what is important is for users to know, first of all, that AI is being used and that there is some sort of an explainability how uh, results have been produced and that the user is in control of applying those results. Now, here we're talking about the impact on human rights. We're not talking about um, the impact of uh, false uh, code impacting a car crash. 
Um, so uh, this is something for each particular type of use to, to have some sort of an expandability for the users on what they can rely on and if uh, they apply it, uh, on what basis they are applying it. So it's more about the issue of expandability and then the possibility of a redress for the people who are affected by it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have a, another question in a similar vein, actually. So um, with regard to Haystack, um, how does Haystack ensure that the data sets are clean of bias so that John Smith is not predisposed to being selected on the basis of race or other such metrics? Um, so that's a great question. And um, Rich, if it's okay with you, I will take that one. So um, the, the simple answer is it can't be absolutely waterproof or, or watertight in terms of achieving that. Um, we can do all the due diligence possible around that sort of data, but ultimately um, bias may have crept into it, especially with data that goes back many years, for example. Um, however, the, the power of Haystack and something that I hope came across clearly in Rich's presentation is that um, when you compare one data set and you combine it with another data set and another data set and another data set, and you, and you keep on going, you end up with multiple views of the same individual or the same event or the same historical um, set of events in time. So actually what you should start to see through a, a tool like Haystack, and again, there are many others out there that do a similar job in, in a similar way. What you're trying to look for from an investigator's perspective is um, where pieces of evidence confirm each other, in which case you're starting to build a, a correct picture, hopefully, and you're also looking for where pieces of evidence or source data conflict with each other and, and refute each other. So again, in, in theory, um, it should help to identify and uncover any issues in the under underlying data, including bias, of course. Okay, so do we have any more questions or would any of the presenters like to comment on anything further before we have a quick look at these use cases, which I've noticed are now starting to settle somewhat. Okay, we have one more question or comment. Just bear with me one second. Okay, a comment and a question at the end. So error developers argue that they do not code or program the computer to be biased or to discriminate. So if the outcome is biased or discriminatory, it is a reflection of the data set. In this context, and taking into account the difference between equality and equity, where equity achieves fairness through treating people differently dependent on need, how can such an objective process, such as AI process, treat people differently dependent on need in order to achieve fairness? Who wants to answer that one from our, from our panel, our presenters? Okay, yeah, Gregor, go, go for it. Uh, I, for one, do not expect the application to achieve fairness. Uh, and we need to distinguish the fairness from a statistical point and from a procedural point. Even in justice, we have um, different uh, aspects of fairness. We have procedural fairness, which is how a person is being treated in the courtroom. And we have distributive justice or distributive fairness how this is perceived uh, by the general community. So uh, I don't expect uh, the system to provide the fair result, but it should be relatively clear to the user if the results are representative and unbiased. But what um, some researchers uh, in Slovenia did, uh, they took um, data set of cases in civil and uh, criminal proceedings, and they try to analyze them if there is some sort of an unseen bias already in the existing decisions that were delivered in the past decade or two. And they have discovered that there is a tendency to um, emphasize certain elements which can contribute to the height of or this, uh, the amount of the sentence or of the damages. And uh, that could uh, point that there has been bias already 
done by the humans. So what can be done through an AI system, we could have a bigger, uh, a higher uh, level of explainability on what elements should be taken into account when assessing uh, damages or pre prescribing uh, a certain sentence. But then again, like I said before, it should be up to the user to determine what is fair. We never should apply it indiscriminately, prescriptively. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gregor. And I think um, Gregor's hit on an, an important and slightly uncomfortable point there, that in many of these scenarios where the, we apply AI systems or especially machine learning models, in many respects, we're shining a light on the data set, a very intrusive light, which in turn highlights many of the biases that may sit in that data set and have been un uncovered or um, hidden for many years. So it really is shining a light back on the original process, to be honest. So we need to be careful about how we handle that and, and how we surface those biases um, and, and, uh, and hopefully eliminate them and, and in increase awareness of them. Um, so uh, unless we have any more questions or, or comments, I'd like to quickly talk about the, the final poll of the results that have come through. So I think we, we've seen number five, uh, use case number five, the analysis of suspicious financial transactions that helps detect money laundering. That's been a, a strong contender since the start. It's kind of held its position up there in the top right of being you know, the highest in terms of feasibility and the highest in terms of the impact on the SDGs. And, I'll be honest with you, that's not particularly surprising. Um, this is a well-established technique that's being used in many financial institutions, uh, government institutions already, to try and uh, detect and prosecute uh, money launderers. So that's not particularly surprising. We've then got a, a group of uh, the remaining um, four sitting just below that. Um, it appears number three is, uh, is kind of holding the lead at the moment, again, in terms of feasibility and the impact on the SDG. So that's the prosecution analytics for an augmented jurisprudence. Um, so we had um, uh, one of our presenters touching on that topic from, uh, from France. So a really interesting subject area and something that I think um, could really add a lot of value going forward. Um, one I think I'd like to bring your attention to uh, around the remaining group of three, um, number one, the predict crime hotspots. So um, it feels like a straightforward thing to, to do and to get value from, but actually is a, a really interesting part of the um, Unicree report touches on this and the and the positive and negative implications of it. So let me just drop that into the um, into the chat that hopefully everyone has access to. And I'd urge you, I think it's the first use case it discusses within that report. It's uh, well worth a, a read, even if you just jump straight to the conclusions. Um, and I think that highlights the kind of the balance between a lot of these use cases and, and applications of AI. Yes, there are clear benefits, but it's rarely a sort of no-brainer and there are certainly um, trade-offs to be had and, and implications, some of which could be negative. So, in time, we need to jump back to the plenary session, which I think that slight change in plan from earlier where we weren't due to head back, but um, at this stage, I think we need to um, leave this breakout room and I thank all of our presenters again and our audience for participating with your interesting questions. Thank you.